Hello, and welcome to the first installment of our Crescent webinar series, Deciphering SAR Around Aromatics. My name is Ray Lawrence, and I'll be your presenter for today. During the session, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to submit them through the GoToMeeting chat pane. The Crescent team is monitoring and will be able to answer your questions as they are submitted. For today's session, we'll follow an agenda that'll include a review of Crescent's technology, We'll look at field points and we'll talk about how we use field points to compare molecules. We'll do a brief overview of Cresset's products. And then finally, we'll jump into our structure activity analysis using FORGE with Activity Miner. Uh, we're going to look at some DPP4 inhibitors. And this can also be done with Torch, where Activity Miner is an optional module. Cresset's philosophy is all about looking at ligands the way they are seen or experienced by the protein receptor. To do this, we step away from the two-dimensional representation and consider a ligand as something that has three-dimensional distribution of shape, charge, and hydrophobicity. Now, comparing molecules using the full molecular electrostatic potential energy surfaces is computationally expensive. There's an awful lot of data points there. So we've distilled this information down into what we call field points, and these are placed at areas of local extrema in these potential energy functions. Blue corresponds to areas where the electrostatics are negative. Red corresponds to areas where the electrostatics are positive. Yellow field points give us an idea of the van der Waals accessible surface area, and orange field points are in areas of hydrophobicity. The size of the field point corresponds to the strength of the field at, at that point in space. Now, the presence of a field point suggests that this is an area of the ligand, which may form a favorable interaction with a protein receptor, provided, of course, the protein receptor has a complementary feature. It is also noteworthy to say that just because a field point doesn't appear, it doesn't mean there's no field at that point in space. It's simply that the field is not at a maximum value at that point. So with Cresset software, we use these 3D field point patterns to compare molecules in a biologically relevant way, the way that a receptor, a receptor would experience the ligands. For example, if we have the bound conformation of cyclic AMP on the left here with this field point pattern, and we have a synthetic analog that has a, a 3D conformation that has a similar field point pattern, then the receptor should see both of these molecules in the same way regardless of how similar or dissimilar their chemical structures are. This allows us to compare molecules at a bioisosteric level and without bias. Now going a step further, the technology can also be used in the ligand design process for optimization or scaffold hopping, which is shown with the changes made to the center molecule to give the molecule on the right, where this bit has been chopped off and a bioisosteric group has been, has been uh, suggested that maintains the overall whole molecule bioisostericity. We do these comparisons with four products, Torch, Spark, Forage, and Blaze. Blaze is for virtual screening. Spark is for bioisosteric replacement and scaffold hopping. Torch and Forge are for design and understanding structure activity relationships. Torch is a medicinal chemistry tool. Forge is a computational chemistry tool, which includes the Torch functionality, but also additional functionality, including pharmacophore templating and three-dimensional QSAR. For our SAR analysis today, we will look at Activity Miner, which is included within Forge and an optional module for Torch. Activity Miner is Cresset's module for rapid SAR interpretation and is based on the notion of activity cliffs. It uses 2D or 3D similarity to measure a distance between pairs of compounds. Combining distance and activity differences for pairs of molecules, we come up with the idea of disparity. Looking at the equation, Molecule pairs that are highly similar but have large differences in activity would be of higher disparity. So this one minus similarity term is effectively a, a distance between two molecules. So we have a couple of examples to look at where we can look at high disparity pairs using two-dimensional and three-dimensional metrics. In this first example, we can see that moving the methyl on the phenyl ring from the meta to the para position results in a large effect in activity. These molecules are highly similar in both 2D and 3D, so the distance between them is quite small. 
This leads to a high disparity in both the two-dimensional and three-dimensional cases. Another example is where we have a ring substitution that changes from a, a CH2 to a carbonyl. This change causes a change in activity of around two log units and also affects the 2D and 3D similarity metrics. Again, the distance between this pair of molecules is small, but with a large change in activity, these molecules are quite disparate. In this case, we see that the three-dimensional metric is also more robust to changes in rings and changes to the center of the molecule. To recap, we get high disparity when molecules are very similar, yet have high activity differences. This is an activity cliff. On the other hand, molecules where there are low disparity between pairs, yet high similarities, these define bioisosteres or, or flat regions on the SAR landscape. These areas can be used to tweak IP, ADMET properties, etc. To use Activity Miner, there's a general workflow that we use for investigating. The first thing we need to do is load the molecules with activity data. We generate alignments to a reference molecule. A reference molecule can be a ligand from a protein ligand crystal structure or a pharmacophore hypothesis. We edit the alignments until we're satisfied that we have the best alignments possible. We select which molecules we want to send to activity minor, where pairwise similarities are calculated in the current orientations. And then we use the four different linked views to mine the activity landscape. To summarize, we have a disparity matrix where it shows the disparity values for all pairs of molecules. We have the top pairs table where the pairs with the highest disparity values are shown. The cluster view gives us a cluster graph using the current similarity method. And finally, the activity view gives us a very much a live way of, of navigating the landscape, looking at disparity and similarity around a specific molecule. Generally, when investigating a structure activity relationship, I tend to look at the top pairs in the disparity matrix to find a starting point and then navigate the landscape using the activity view. In our practical software demonstration today, we'll examine the structure activity relationship around the terminal phenyl of the citagliptin analogs. In the interest of time, the set of molecules were previously aligned to the ligands of 2QOE, which is citagliptin, and 2P8S, a citagliptin analog. It turns out that the star around this aromatic ring is surprisingly complex and not immediately obvious. So now we'll, we will open Forge and take a look. Now I have our DPP inhibitors loaded within Forge, and they are pre-aligned, and they were pre-aligned to a couple of crystal structures. One had the citagliptin inhibitor, another had an analog, and these structures were obtained from the protein data bank. So if we select this set of analogs, which are all overlaid here, we can send those over to Activity Miner where we will do the SAR analysis. This will take a couple of moments as the software compares each molecular pair for distance and disparity. There are four main views in Activity Miner. The first that comes up is a cluster view, which allows us to get a feel for how similar or diverse compounds in the data set are. The clustering can be displayed for both 2D and 3D, which is our field-based similarity. The top pairs view is a quick way to identify activity cliffs. In this table, the pairs of molecules with the highest disparity are shown. Note that the differences in the molecules are highlighted in the 2D structural table. The disparity matrix is a 35,000 foot overview of the data set where we can quickly identify the most disparately pair, disparate pairs. Those are the pairs that the coloring is the most brightly colored as well as the direction that the disparity is taking us. Green gives us a, a push towards more active. Red gives us a push towards less active. For anal our analysis today, we will use the activity view, where the focus is much like the lens of a camera, and it's on the most active compound, in our case, the lead compound, citagliptin. Looking at the activity view lens, our focus molecule, citagliptin, is shown in the center of the lens and is shown on the left in this uh, 3D display window. 
Shown around the ring are the 10 most similar compounds. The shorter the lens segment, the less distance from the focus molecule. So it's a higher similarity. The red and green colors and their shading is the same as in the disparity matrix. Darker shading means more disparity, and green pushes us towards more active. You can increase the number of nearest neighbors by using the slide bar on the left to de decrease the similarity threshold. So now if we click on the second segment, and we want to look at our focus molecule and compare it to the 2-chloro-4,5-difluoro analog, we see that there's, you know, the similarity is quite high. I mean, we've got a similarity score of 0.993, but we have a, an activity difference that's about a log unit. If we compare the field point patterns of these two molecules, we see that not only is the chlorine a shade bigger, but it also in introduces a small positive charge. And that's at the end of that, that chlorine in the two position. If we show the electrostatic potential energy surfaces, we can see that the, the chlorine does have a, a bit of positivity out there. And if we look at our difference mode, we see that this positivity is shown. So this is effectively showing where the differences and fields are between these two molecules. Now, if we click on the segment associated with 3 fluorodifluoro version, we now see what happens when we remove negative charge from position 2. So we've removed this, this fluorine charge. So we're getting an even bigger increase in the positivity around this section. And this is causing a, a decrease in the activity. In this case, we've gone from 8.2 down to 6.9. This suggests that the activity can be improved by having a substituent in the 2 position of the ring that has a negative end. In the crystal structure, it turns out that there is an interaction with an arginine and the, the, uh, the NH2 group of an asparagine side chain. So that, that negativity in this position is, is very much important for the structure activity relationship. So that was position two. Now if we look at position four, which is our para position, now if we compare to the 2,5-difluoro, where we've removed that negativity here, we've caused a, a decrease in the activity again. Going a step further, if we decrease our similarity threshold, so that we take a look at the 2,3,5-trifluoro version, we completely move the negative charge off of this position, so onto the 3 position now, so from the 4 position to the 3 position, we see a huge decrease in the, in the activity. So now when we look at the field differences, we're seeing positivity out towards here. Now this is not immediately obvious from the crystal structure when you're looking at the structure activity relationship because there's a number, number of interactions with several residues. So effectively at this four position, we want to make sure that we have something that's negative in, in order to, uh, to drive the activity upwards. Now I'm going to hit the auto button to take us back to our, our 10 nearest neighbors again. So now we'll look at the, the structure activity relationship around the five position. So to do this, we'll look at the comparison of, again, our focus molecule with the 246 trifluoro version. And we see that we've got a, a decrease in activity, again, from 8.2 to 7.06. And if we, again, if we look at the potential energy surfaces and look at the differences, we see that by by taking that negativity from the 5 position, we've decreased the activity. Now in the crystal structure, the atom in this position, in this 5 position, points towards an electropositive edges of, of indole of tryptophan 659 and the, the positive edges of the phenyl of a tyrosine 670. Thus, a negative end in this 5 position favors activity. Finally, we want to look at the changes that affect the electron density of the phenyl ring itself. 
To do this, we'll change our focus molecule to the three floor difluoro by double clicking on that segment. So if we go around the ring, three floor difluoro, double click. So now our focus is the three floor difluoro version, and we can look at the nearest neighbors around this one. So to look at how the you know, how we look at the the electrostatics of the phenyl ring with the substitution, if we look at the chlorinated version we see that the phenyl ring is, is quite a bit more negative than it is in the, the fluorinated version. So what we could say there is that with a ring system that's more electron poor, we're driving the activity upwards. So again, that ring is showing positivity with the fluorinated version, and it's a little bit more negative with the, the chlorinated version. And this makes sense because fluorine is a fairly strong electron withdrawing group. In fact, it's probably a little more than fairly strong. Again, with the crystal structure, the catalytic serine, together with a couple of tyrosine residues, point their respective alcohol oxygen atoms towards the ring face. So we've got those, those hydrogens, or sorry, those oxygens, those lone pairs of the oxygens, interacting with the, the positivity above and below the plane of, of this ring. So as you scan through the star landscape using the activity view, you can backtrack using these, these left and right green buttons. So if we wanted to go back to what we were looking at before, we would simply click the button on the left. Now, while much of our SAR hypothesis could have been deduced from studying the protein crystal structure, however, the field difference mode with an activity minor helps us hone in on the interactions and, and rationalize our observations. Subtleties including the differences between electron-rich and electron-poor rings are easily visualized, leading us to explain some really complicated structure activity relationships in a, in a way that's not only visual but also intuitive. Now finally, with our SAR hypothesis in hand, we can now use this information to, to design new ligands with better physchem properties and possibly in, even in some open IP space. Equally, we can look for new ideas or bioisosteric fragments for the section of that molecule using SPARC, where we could retain the activity but really drive into new intellectual property space. So this concludes our experiment for today. If you would like to take a trial of Activity Miner, either within Torch or Forge, I encourage you to contact inquiries at crescentgroup.com. Or alternatively, if you visit our website at the link below, you can download a 30-day trial directly. We do have some upcoming webinars and events. We've got two more web sessions coming up on the 29th of April uh, and the 27th of May. The first one will be Where Next? Using Reagent Bait Databases to Find the Next Move. And in May, we'll be talking about cloud-based virtual screening. And then in June, we've got two events. On the 11th, we have Field-Based Chemistry North America, which will be held in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And on the 19th and 20th, we have Field-Based Chemistry Europe, which is being held in Cambridge, UK. If you visit our website under the Events tab, you'll see other events that we've got going on, and you can keep up to date with where, we are, where we're going to be. Finally, I thank you for your time today, and if you have any questions or would like additional information, please feel free to email me at ray at Thank you very much, and have a great day.